Now, this won't hurt a bit. I adore the stop-motion Rankin-Bass holiday specials. Yeah, even the bad ones. There's something really mesmerizing about the simplicity of stop-motion animation, a power which modern CGI hasn't diminished as seen by the modern successes of Tim Burton, Nick Park, and Wes Anderson. Paddington 2, which as Nicolas Cage will tell you is the greatest film of all time, Paddington 2 is incredible, includes a surprising stop-motion vignette that had the same magical quality. It's fantasy, but it's tangible fantasy. The Rankin-Bass stop-motion specials covered a lot of ground. They did the odd but likable time travel film, Rudolph's Happy New Year, and a frosty Rudolph crossover that was a bit over long, The Year Without a Santa Claus, which introduced one of the best Christmas songs ever. I'm Mr. White Christmas. I'm Mr. Snow. I'm Mr. Icicle. I'm Mr. Ten Below. The unexpectedly romantic Santa Claus is Coming to Town, the totally bizarre Adventures of Santa Claus based on a novel by Wizard of Oz's Frank L. Baum, but my favorite is probably the tragic lovelorn Jack Frost in which the hero tries to be human for love and ultimately surrenders his romantic ambitions to another man. This is a complicated filmography, especially for children's TV specials. Rankin Bass took risks, and many of them paid off. I enjoy the Lego Star Wars special or Guardians of the Galaxy or Madagascar Penguins, but the 50s and 60s specials were edgier than what we see today. I mean, who would have thought that having a mellow soundtrack to a Charlie Brown cartoon would turn into a jazz classic? Rudolph was the apex of that magic, not weighed down by Wes Anderson's self-awareness or Tim Burton's hipster chic or Nick Park's desperate wackiness, all of which I love, by the way. But Rudolph is so incredibly sincere that I have to applaud it, even when he gets really weird. Bye, buddy. Hope to find your dad. Thanks, Mr. Narwhal. Bye. The character of Rudolph was created as a Christmas advertising gimmick for the department store Montgomery Ward, created by Robert L. May, who happened to be Jewish, ironic for the creator of one of the most famous Christmas stories of all time. May created the character while on company time, and thus he never saw any royalties for his work. His brother-in-law liked the character and wrote a song to tell Rudolph's story. They tried to sell this. Bing Crosby turned the song down. Henry Brannon said yes. Brannon was another crooner who nearly played Bing in a canceled biographical film and ended up as a Latter-day Saints priest while we're on the ecumenical tip. Bannon's version of the song did fine, but it was Gene Autry's cover in 1949, 10 years later, that hit number one on the charts. And another 15 years later, Rankin Bass put out this special. The story could be told in a two-minute song, so the TV special added a few things to flesh it out. Most of what's added is weird. The Island of Misfit Toys feels stolen from Narnia. Santa's on a weight gain program. They expect a fat Santa. There's a chorus of forest animals. And a feel-good ending where Santa delivers defective toys to the children of the world. <laughs> Several characters are portrayed as real jerks. Rudolph's father Donner is a jerk. His teacher, Comet, is a jerk. Even King Moonracer, the movie's Aslan, kicks guests out of his palace into the Arctic wasteland after one night. Santa Claus, the self-proclaimed king of jingling, is a jerk, reinforcing Donner and Comet's prejudices. Now, I'm sure it'll stop as soon as he grows up, Santa. Well, let's hope so if he wants to make the sleigh team someday. And insulting his staff constantly. Even harmless snowman Sam tosses off sexist comments. But they realize that the best thing to do is to get the women back to Christmas Town. But the greatness of this special is that those dismissive and sexist comments are the point. Mrs. Donner wanted to go along, naturally, but Donner said, No, this is man's work. Sam the Snowman is actually wrong. Saving Rudolph is man's work. But Rudolph's mom and Clarice wait literally three seconds after Donner is gone before heading out to find Rudolph. In the end, Santa apologizes. Donner apologizes, albeit in a backhanded way. I knew that nose would be useful someday. I knew it all along. A major theme in movies I love, Return of the Jedi, When Harry Met Sally, etc., is forgiveness. And that's certainly the center of this story. Rudolph is mocked and held back and ostracized until he exiles himself. But when the North Pole needs him, he doesn't hesitate to step up and save the day. Similarly, Hermie the Elf, who we'll talk about in a minute, is yelled at and threatened until he roams the earth like Cain on Kung Fu. But he comes back to provide health care to the same community that attacked him. A lot of the terrible behavior in the film is outlandish to the point of being funny. Now listen! We have dolls that cry, talk, walk, blink, and run at temperature! We don't need any chewing dolls! 
Rudolph's own father, Santa Claus, and his friends are more of a threat than the big bad, the abominable snow monster, is, who chases Rudolph across the Arctic and is big and scary and almost eats Rudolph's family. The abominable gets pummeled with boulders and ice, has his teeth ripped out, and is thrown over a cliff. And then he meekly comes around to help out decorating the Christmas tree. This, by the way, is the fate of all tall people at Christmas time. If anyone shows forgiveness in this film, it's the bumble. As for Donner and Santa, Rudolph has to prove himself before they apologize, but apologize they do. On the other end of the spectrum are Hermie and Yukon Cornelius and Clarice. These characters stick by Rudolph through thick and thin, risking their lives to save him. Despite all the casual sexism from Sam the Snowman and Donner, the female characters in Rudolph are consistently more insightful and empathetic than their male counterparts, and equally brave. Mrs. Donner accepts Rudolph's deformity immediately. We'll simply have to overlook it. But her husband shuts that down. Now how can you overlook that? Santa is completely rude about his staff's musical performance, but Mrs. Claus encourages them to keep going. Uh, it needs work. I have to go. What does Papa know? It's beautiful. You keep it just the way it was. At flying practice, the does are positive while the bucks are combative, and Clarice accepts Rudolph for who he is immediately, whereas Fireball dumps him and mocks him. It's as if the writers were quietly challenging not only the treatment of misfits, but also the dismissive 50s view of women. There's an odd moment when Clarice's father steps in to separate Clarice and Rudolph. Now there's one thing I want to make very plain. No doe of mine is going to be seen with a, a red-nosed reindeer. Maybe I'm reading too much into this, but that does have a very guess who's coming to dinner feel to it. More obvious, Hermie, the elf dentist. I am far from the only person who sees Hermie as coded as, well, more than just a dentist. Those eyes, that dreamy hair, that pause. Not if you don't mind me being a dentist. Yukon Cornelius is less clearly coded. I'm not going to label him a bear, but he wrestles like one, and he's licking his tool constantly. Maybe he's just eccentric. Maybe he's flamboyant. In the original cut, he was looking not for silver and gold, but for peppermint mines, which explains the weird licking the pickaxe thing. Peppermint! What I've been searching for all my life! He was initially booted as the film's narrator when the studio insisted on getting a big name on board, Burl Ives. Now, even if that's a stretch, and it probably is, the eccentrics Hermie and Cornelius are definitely the yin and yang. They're the ones who stand by Rudolph through thick and thin, even when he ditches them. Pretty surprising for a 1950s children's special. The soundtrack to this film is on constant repeat Chez Nu, along with Vince Guaraldi, Frank Sinatra, Esquivel, and Elvis. Is it cheesy? Oh yeah, but it's also the epitome of mid-century swank. Here's where it gets really weird. Rudolph is the most quintessential American Christmas special, yet it's largely a Canadian-Japanese production. Let me elucidate. Every actor in the film, aside from the legendary Burl Ives, who was foisted on Rankin Bass by their backers, was Canadian. Rankin and Bass had found recording in Canada a considerable financial advantage when making their series Return to Oz, and this film kept that model with a group of unknown actors, even if Charlie in the Box is trying to sound like Ed Wynn. That's why I'm a misfit toy. The animation was all done in Tokyo. Animator Mochinaga Tadahito pretty much invented stop-motion animation when he was working for the Manchurian puppet government in China. They had asked him for a film mocking President Chiang Kai-shek as a literal puppet of the USA, and he delivered. When the war ended, Mochinaga moved back to Japan and continued using his new technology for children's films and advertising. A huge fan of Mickey Mouse, Mochinaga was delighted to begin collaborating with Rankin of Rankin Bass, which led to decades of innovative animation. <laughs> So there you have it, a Christmas story based on a department store ad created by a Jewish marketing exec and a song sung by a Mormon priest, made popular by a singing cowboy, filmed by a pro-imperial propaganda artist in Japan, voiced by Canadian actors, with an obvious message of loving the outcast, but sneaking in other kinds of outcasts for a fairly progressive message. On one hand, Rudolph is as American as apple pie. On the other hand, that apple pie is really good. I am delighted that this film continues to be a perennial favorite. You go down in history.